So my name is Ian Andrews. I'm VP of Products at Pivotal. Uh, if I say anything super controversial or you just want to harass me on Twitter, that's my handle there. Apparently that's all Twitter's good for these days is harassing people. So I'm, I'm trying to encourage it. Um, so I, I, uh, the, the best part of my job is I get to fly around the world and actually meet with customers who are using our products and technology. Uh, so I thought today what would be interesting is actually to hear about some of the other customers that are uh, have been working with Pivotal for some time and how they're thinking about this, uh, this transformation journey and adoption of technology like Cloud Foundry and Spring Boot and some of the other uh, products in the Pivotal portfolio. So hopefully that'll be useful for everyone today. Before we jump into it, a little quiz. Who knows who Roger Bannister is? Yeah. Who's Roger Bannister? He's the first person to break the four minute mark. That's right. And uh, so Roger Bannister, if you're into running at all, is the first human to ever run a mile uh, in less than four minutes. And he did this 1960-ish. So if you go read, uh, there, were, there were a bunch of people around that time who were very close to breaking the four minute mile, right? They were running 401, 402. Um, but there were actually people who were saying if you ever ran faster than a four minute mile, your legs would fly off. You would break all your bones, your tendons would explode. It was sort of this impossible feat. Uh, and so Roger Bannister broke through the four minute mile and then he did it again like a couple months later and then there was another gentleman whose name escapes me who also broke the four minute mile within a couple years. Today running a four minute mile is actually something that a you know, reasonably good high school track athlete can do. So there's hundreds of people that now run or thousands of people that have run sub four minute miles. But as recently as 40 years ago, it was sort of thought to be impossible. So big takeaway from my presentation, in case you want to get up and leave before the end, is it seems impossible as you first walk in the door and approach this problem of trying to get big organizations to do new and innovative things. But it's actually not. It's entirely possible. And I've got the proof that people have already broken through the four minute mile, accomplished amazing things. And so everyone in this room should feel like you can do it as well. All right, so that's the big takeaway. You can get up and leave if you want to get a coffee or anything. There's really nothing that interesting to see here after that. Um, I just sat down with Paul Vincent from Gartner. So I, I feel good about having a Gartner stat in my, uh, in my presentation here. But uh, Gartner, and I think most of the world at this point, is aware of this shift. Uh, Rob Mee talked about it this morning, is this shift away from outsourcing or offshoring, where software development is now becoming a core competency. And so Gartner's prediction is that in large enterprise, by the end of this decade, you'll see about 75% of build versus buy decisions fall into that build camp, which is a pretty large swing of the pendulum from, say, the start of the decade, where I think it was probably the other direction. So really, there's this renaissance coming of companies that are investing lots and lots of money in hiring and developing uh, talented in-house software development practices. Uh, Georgina from Allstate shared a story with, with uh, you know, about their their journey through that over the last couple of years last night at dinner. So you should all grab her at the end of this if you want to hear more about this topic. But I think there's a couple big macro trends that are driving, driving this shift and why, uh, why everyone in this room should be paying attention to it if you're not. Um, for me, I think there's, there's two uh, massive things that have happened over the last 10 years that are extremely meaningful. So in 2007, the first iPhone was introduced. Um, and that really brought about the existence of the, the mobile internet. And today, if you read folks like Benedict Evans, who works for Andreessen Horowitz and does a lot of research into uh, kind of mobile phone adoption and penetration, his view is by the end of the decade, we'll go from uh, near global penetration of, of uh, these mobile handsets to full penetration. So meaning every single human on the planet will have an internet connected device capable of you know, running apps. Um, which if you go back just 10 years, I mean that's a radical shift in human behavior uh, in a very, very short period of time. So that, that trend coupled with the emergence of public cloud, which has given us on demand uh, an extremely inexpensive infrastructure, compute, storage, and networking for uh, a fraction of what it cost us 
in dollars or pounds uh, previously, but more importantly, uh, in terms of time required to provision the resource. It's gone to almost zero. So the collision of these two things has resulted in a scenario today where literally everything that our customers do, our partners do, that probably we do in our own lives, is driven through this lens of software. And that becomes the new, uh, the new customer experience. So the, the question that I think a lot of firms are now faced with is after a decade or two decades of treating IT generally as a cost center, um, where you, you want to minimize investment and spend, uh, we now have to shift mindset to this is the core competitive advantage of the business. And that's a frightening thing to do, right? So this is why folks like Jeff Immelt, um, so GE is an investor in Pivotal. Uh, and Jeff, you know, he, he took over GE at a really interesting transitionary period in their history where GE Capital uh, in the last decade made almost all the profit at GE. Uh, but almost all the employees and, and the, uh, the bulk of the business of what people thought of GE came from their industrial business units, right? Making jet airplane engines and MRI devices and all the other things that we, windmills, uh, power turbines. And Jeff's view of the future of GE was, well, let's get out of the business of banking because we're an industrial company. But more importantly, we're a software company. And if you look at GE's business today, uh, they've actually, they've shed the GE Capital business. They spun that off as an organization called Synchrony. But most of their profit is now coming from services they deliver along with their industrial machines. So actual management and operations. In a lot of ways, GE's business looks more similar to a mobile phone operator who sells the hardware at a slight loss to slight profit and then collects the service, service fees around that. And so for them, it was hugely important to optimize uh, to become a software business. Right? A lot of their contracts are performance-based, so they had opportunity to reap outsized profits by being excellent at software. That's, that's a, uh, an amazing opportunity if you can execute on it, and it's frightening if you're not very good at technology. Uh, and so the team at GE, uh, they had actually stood up, uh, GE is very into this concept of centers of excellence, so they stamped them out all over the world. They had built one in San Ramon, California called the Software Center of Excellence, which has since in the last three years become the, the digital division of GE led by a guy named Bill Rue that actually sits on Pivotal's board. Um, but GE has, has since launched a platform called uh, Predix. Do you guys get the commercials over here for GE, the goofy ones with the develop? In the US, they run these commercials uh, that's all about a college age guy gets a new job uh, at GE as a developer. You know, and people are throwing a party for him because he got a job as a developer, and then he says, I'm going to work at GE. And they're like, wait, you're going to work on trains? Or anyway. That's all about this platform called Predix, which is their next generation platform for managing Internet of Things and all of GE's connected devices. That's all built on Cloud Foundry. Um, so pretty exciting project that we're working on with them. I think the, the most interesting takeaway from, from this was GE actually tried to build their own platform before we started working with them three years ago. They had 400 people in this uh, center in San Ramon who were focused intently on building something that, uh, in you know, the best light, looked like Cloud Foundry. And it turns out that's actually really hard. And you need a lot more people than that and a lot more time. And GE's expertise wasn't in the platform infrastructure layer. It was actually a layer above that, right? They deeply understand what jet engines do, the data produced by them, how to optimize you know, maintenance processes and things like that. And so the collaboration has been excellent because they were able to step above the, the lower infrastructure level, assume that piece just works, it's already been built by Pivotal, and, and focus on the layer on top of that. And that sped their time to market greatly. So I think the big takeaway here is decide where your value and differentiation is gonna be as you look at building out these software platforms and what you absolutely need to build versus what you can bring in off, off the shelf. I think Tim, Tim Jennings made this point actually earlier this morning, so I'm stealing from him a little bit. Um, 
Jamie Dimon, CEO of JPMC, he's, he's very famous for kind of calling out the, the explosion of fintech investment that was coming. Uh, we, we like this quote about Silicon Valley coming and they want to eat our lunch. Um, and I find this particularly interesting because if you, if you talk to George Sherman, who's the CIO at, at JPMC, I think he has something on the order of a $7 billion IT budget. And so if you add up all the investment that's gone into fintechs from a VC perspective, it's actually fractional to his, his annualized technology spend. So uh, when you talk about investment, I don't think JPMC has an investment challenge, but I do think they have a huge portfolio management problem. And so the really interesting thing that their team developed is this idea of a cloud native maturity model. And anyone that lives through the kind of the virtualization uh, you know, bare metal to virtualization that happened in the, the early to mid 2000s, there were a lot of virtualization maturity models. So they're kind of borrowing on the concept here. But what they, what they basically did is they actually took a portfolio strategy that said, look, there's a series of characteristics that as our applications adopt these, it makes the technology more suitable for cloud uh, meaning, hey, yeah, we can run it easily on a platform like Cloud Foundry, but also there's going to be higher return to us in terms of reducing our operational spend to keep these, uh, these applications running. Right? So almost all the customers that Pivotal works with today, very large enterprise. And so there's, there's always this question of what do I do with the existing estate? Right? It's great to come to Pivotal Labs and build a new application, but that's a fraction of my existing portfolio. Right? Most companies I talk to are 80 to 90% of spend goes into keeping the lights on in the existing infrastructure. The innovation or the new things budget is, is very, very small as a percentage of total spend. And so ultimately you come down to this kind of portfolio management question about what do we do with all the stuff we already have? And I, I believe pretty strongly that the consideration really needs to be about most important applications to the business. What runs the core of your platform today? How suitable is it on some of these technical characteristics to move to cloud and actually get benefits from an operational efficiency developer productivity standpoint that would be given to you by a platform like Cloud Foundry? Uh, and what, if any, is the cost of that transition? I think that gives you a portfolio strategy to really take apart the existing uh, estate and decide what goes forward in the future on what schedule. Um, so definitely an important lesson to be learned from, uh, from JPMC. Another big uh, customer of ours is actually Home Depot. Um, you don't have Home Depot in the UK, do you? They don't. So Thank you. B and Q. B and Q? Got it. Yeah. So this is the DIY place. This is where you go when uh, you decide you want to build a fence on the weekend because your, your day job isn't hard enough. Um, in the US, uh, Home Depot has largely been protected from the Amazon experience, right? Amazon has ev eviscerated almost all the uh, normal retail in the United States. All the big box retailers have suffered greatly from Amazon. but. Uh, I think because of Home Depot's uh, products, like uh, you know, a sledgehammer is pretty heavy. So shipping it was not something that Amazon went into early. But they've now actually aggressively entered the, the uh, DIY market. And so Amazon had, the, or Home Depot rather, had this moment of realization uh, about two years ago where they woke up and said, uh, you know, Amazon's now selling more hammers than we are. And this is sort of this existential epiphany about, hey, we need to be looking at ourselves not just as a retailer, but as a technology company. And to their credit, they went out and hired uh, an executive who had a ton of vision and uh, was willing to come in and really transform an organization um, into being very forward thinking about how they adopted technology. And so their journey um, has been one of, of significant people change as well as platform and tools change. And, and now, two years on, there are uh, uh, you know, over 2,000 application instances, 900 developers on the platform, which is a significant milestone. This is radical change for, for Home Depot. So I think these are, you know, this is the example of, of Roger Bannister, right? The folks that fo people said could never do it, suddenly breaking through um, and, and having dramatic progress and adoption of new platforms, new techniques. And, and the, 
Well, this is kind of at the infrastructure level. The impact of this has been to be able to launch significant new business services. So one of the first things that we worked with Home Depot on is they're interested in moving into the sharing economy. So they have this whole tool rental business that was historically very paper process driven. And now today has, has been entirely digitized. They worked with Pivotal Labs on the whole development process. And then they've stamped out uh, you know, a number of applications after that. So this has been a, a radical across both the development and operations team uh, shift uh, in how they do things. Uh, traveler's insurance is another, another example of this. Um, the, the chief architect at Traveler's is a guy named Pierre. Um, and Pierre has, has come up with this model and concept uh, that he talks about driving towards business agility as being the key metric for his technology organization, right? That's ultimately the thing that he wants to measure his success or failure of the organization against is how much business agility am I generating? And so this was some, a Twitter exchange that he was having um, talking about his path to getting to business agility. He saw it as platform as a service, in this case Cloud Foundry, plus uh, agile in terms of a process for his developers to, to follow plus microservices as an architectural design concept allowed travelers, which is an organization with a ton of legacy infrastructure and architecture, lots of their core business systems still run against the mainframe. This was a, this was a path to business agility and modernization. Um, and then he talked, uh, he went on to say later about how through this process of modernization, he's actually achieved simplification which is a pretty radical thought, right? This idea that I can take, um, take an application that I wrote years ago and, and bring it forward into a modern architecture and make it actually easier to maintain in the future. So 30% less code uh, by refactoring, is a, that's a powerful thing, right? If you're thinking about lines of code in the organization and ongoing maintenance associated with that. Um, this is, this is Pierre's stool. This is actually a slide that he uses, his components of business agility. So it's what he was talking about earlier in the slide. Uh, so those are some customer examples of, uh, of folks that we're working with. Shifting gears a little bit, and I was, I was happy to note that, uh, that Robbie's um, bibliography at the end, his recommended reading, I actually am gonna reference some of those, so I feel like we planned our presentations well. But I, I recommend this book, Lean Enterprise. Uh, Jez Humble and his associates put it together. The big concept that was significant in this for me was, I think most enterprise IT doctrine for the last at least decade, maybe going back two decades, has been an argument that service availability and velocity of change are directly relational, right, in a linear fashion. So if I want five nines of availability, the only path to achieving that is basically allow the environment never to change. And if I want to allow lots of changes, I'm uh, implicitly uh, unable to offer that five nines of availability, right? I'm gonna be something less than that. And you see this in, you know, if anybody's familiar with ITIL, Right, the, the implementation of ITIL, even this, if this wasn't the spirit of it, the implementation of it in most organizations that I've seen is we're gonna establish a process wall that is so high you will give up before you get your change through the organization, right? You will, after the 25th trouble ticket bounces back and forth for the approvals, you'll just say forget about it, right? And walk away. And, and that, that has this rate limiting factor on change activity which in theory is actually driving higher service availability. Now in practice, I think we actually know that that linkage isn't, isn't necessarily true, right? We still have lots of outages even if we're limiting change activity. Um, but the interesting observation in this Lean Enterprise book, so Jez and his colleagues actually went out and did field research and measured technology organizations, and they said in high-performing organizations, there is no relationship between these two things. In fact, high-performing organizations are able to lift both service availability and velocity of change at the same time. So we can enable things like continuous delivery, where we're constantly changing the environment, um, and at the same time enable, um, enable that five nines sort of unicorn of availability. Which I think is a really interesting concept to think about, right? If you could rebuild your, your estate 
in the model where it was built to accept change rather than resistant to change. Right? And by resistant to change, I mean this idea that, hey, if we ever touch it, it's going to break. So please don't touch it. If we can avoid, you know, if we can shift the mindset to saying, no, the infrastructure is built assuming that at the component level, things will break or change all the time, and we must be resilient to that, that's, that's a pretty interesting model. I think you would see this in Netflix as an example, right? If you read any of uh, the materials about how they've designed their infrastructure. Like, does anyone heard of Chaos Monkey? Or the Simeon Army? Okay, so Netflix, uh, Netflix actually built, after one of the, their early move to Amazon, uh, they had a couple fairly spectacular service outages where things in Amazon that should work just failed. And, and they realized that they had uh, application architects and developers building systems that weren't necessarily resilient to everything. They were making an assumption that, hey, if Amazon says it's going to work, it's going to work. Why do I need to think about the potential for failure? And so they actually wrote a piece of software. The first one was Chaos Monkey, which would intentionally go and cause outages of components in the architecture. Right? It would simulate the failure of Amazon's elastic load balancers, or it would just randomly kill virtual machines. They've since expanded this to what's called the Simian Army to target different parts of, of, uh, of their platform architecture. And, and the result of this, now as a developer and a software architect and an, and an engineer, you know that you're subject to random failures frequently because they just unleash this on the infrastructure at random points in time. No pre-warning, no, uh, no alert goes out, it just runs. So you have to design your systems to be resilient at the application layer, right? And that actually shifts radical mindset shift in terms of service availability. Seems like an expensive way to change culture. <laughs> <laughs> cultural issue, right? I, I think it is a cultural issue, but I mean, how, you know, there's the carrot and the stick approach, I guess. This was a fairly big stick. <laughs> um, so when we talk about some of the other things that I think are, are necessary to be changed here, and I, I'm sure you got a lot of this from, from Robbie and his talk about labs model, so I'll, I'll highlight. Um, some of these. I think from a development process, probably everyone in this room uh, is, is in agreement that you know, shorter, faster cycles, iterative development, high, you know, fast feedback loops all drive better product. Right? And that, that's kind of core to the, the model that we espouse here at Labs, but I think is generally at the, at the heart of, of the Agile movement. We also see this shift um, in architecture from monolith to microservices. How many people know the term microservices, just curious. Everybody's heard of it. How many people are actually running applications today that you would consider to be microservices? Maybe, ish. OK, we got one maybe and no other hands. Um, so here's my short pitch on microservices. Uh, it's not an engineering optimization. It's a human optimization, right? So a computer is most happy when everything runs in a single thread on a single CPU core. Right? That's the perfect application from a computer standpoint, because there's no latency. Right? Ideally, everything fits in RAM, too, so it's a super fast boss. So now insert network in between your application process. Right? Network has latency that's unpredictable. You know, add you know, disk subsystems and remote systems, and all of a sudden you've introduced all this complexity. That's a microservices application. If you're building it and running it in containers on public cloud, you've got to deal with noisy neighbors and all these externalities that are hard to control, super hard to predict. So from an engineering perspective, microservices introduce a huge amount of challenge from an architectural design perspective. Um, and so the, the question that I think reasonable people ask is like, hey, why would we ever want to do that? That seems, that doesn't seem, sound like fun. Like I don't want harder problems to solve at work. I want to, you know. Easy solutions are better. But I think that, so the reason why I call this a human, uh, it's a human optimization um, is much like small, deploying smaller batch sizes, shorter development cycles leads to better outcomes. Uh, microservices allows you to optimize team size. So you can have smaller teams of people working on a more, uh, a narrower feature set, a smaller problem domain. And by loosely coupling these microservices, right, you hear uh, the loosely uh, coupled bounded context is kind of the definition of a microservice. That allows you to deploy at different 
velocities, right? Uh, and so now you have teams that can ship independently of each other rather than waiting for all the other development teams to ship their product. They have the ability to, you know, you may have a team that is moving extremely fast, wants to ship 10 times a day, and then you have other teams where the service is fairly mature, not a lot of changes needed, rarely deploying. This architectural model allows you to do that. So in effect, you can optimize your development resources uh, for high velocity, uh, fast feedback, continuous delivery models. Um, we're also seeing huge shift to uh, API-driven architectures. Uh, Apigee is a big pivotal partner, but we work with a number of these API platforms that kind of fit into the, the Cloud Foundry architecture. Uh, but I think from a design point perspective, you know, well, uh, well thought out, uh, API is, is sort of a standard that we're seeing people move to as you uh, build these new applications. And as you take existing applications, uh, we were having a conversation at dinner last night and it was uh, taming the monolith was described as eating an elephant. Right? How do you eat an elephant? One piece at a time. That's right, one bite at a time. It's hard to get the whole thing in your mouth. Um, same thing from taking a large existing monolithic application and going to a microservices architecture. There's this idea that you can sort of peel off one service at a time. That almost implicitly dictates uh, APIs between these newly built services and the existing architecture in order to keep, keep applications running. Uh, disposable infrastructure is another concept that becomes very important here. How many people know the, the cattle versus pets? I got a couple people smiling. So uh, with, with pets when they get sick, what do you do with them? Take them to the vet. That's right. And with cattle, what do you do? Shoot them. <laughs> Texas. <laughs> I was going to say get a new get a new cow, but uh, Sorry. <laughs> um, and and so this the the metaphor applies to infrastructure. Where I think uh, you know if you go back to the early two thousands, you could go find the sysadmin in your organization. He knew all the servers by name because he had named them, just like pets. He knew their IP addresses by heart because he had memorized them. Uh, you know, in today's world of, of public cloud infrastructure, container-driven infrastructure, not only do you have more things, but they, they're ephemeral in a lot of cases, right? They go away at any time. Uh, if you're practicing continuous delivery, you're constantly making changes to that infrastructure. If the application's not behaving, it's often easier to simply recycle it, right? Treat it like uh, cattle. Hopefully not shoot it, just get a new one. <laughs> Poor cows. Um, so, so this is, a, again, a shift in mindset about how you treat infrastructure. What does it mean to actually build and certify infrastructure? How, you know, where are you going to expend resources in your organization from a uh, you know, value return perspective, right? Is it on operating system provisioning and patch management, or is it higher up the stack? Um, continuous delivery. How many people are familiar with this concept? How many people are doing it today? Right, we got two yeses, a maybe, two maybes. Um, how many people are scared of it as a concept? Okay, how many people want to get to it? All right, that's pretty good actually, I like that. So I think the big takeaway for me here is I think a lot of people have the, the misperception that continuous delivery or continuous deployment is about bypassing all your safeguards and just taking code directly from a developer's desktop into production. That's not it at all. <laughs> um, and, and in fact, you know, you probably heard, you've heard a couple people talk about this, this idea of test-driven development and tests living with the code and full test coverage. I think that's actually implicit as a prerequisite before you can get to a model of continuous delivery. But really the, the idea here is that whenever you've passed all these safeguards and checks, whatever your model, whether it's test-driven development or a QA team, and a security audit team, or, or you've managed to automate much of that, is this idea that once you've called it ready to go, the time between that and it actually appearing in production where someone can touch it is effectively zero, or as close to zero time elapsed as you can get. And I think for most organizations, that's a really big challenge to get comfortable with that mindset. Uh, I was at a bank that will go unnamed in Canada about two months ago, 
And they said, look, our, our biggest challenge today is it's 10 weeks between code complete and code and prod. And the ops, the ops team uh, manager said, yeah, and 10% of my organization is dedicated to shepherding that code across that process. I asked him how big his organization was. He goes, well, you know, it's probably about a, you know, 100, 110 people. I said, oh, so we're talking about 10 folks. Kind of do, and he goes, no, my organization's 1,100 people. There's 110 people that I have who just marshal code from test, uh, test dev into production. And it takes 10 weeks. And their goal was to get down to five days. They wanted to have same week deployability, code complete on Monday, live in production by Friday. Right? I mean, that's a radically different mindset in terms of how quick you can go. But I think that is why most agile projects in large enterprises tend to fail. Because you set your developers up asking them to go really fast. And the ops team is sitting there going, whoa, no way. Please don't do that. <laughs> Right? Every time we deploy, we break things, as we talked about earlier. Don't deploy that often. Um, and then finally, my, my, uh, my friend and colleague, Andrew Clay Schaefer, likes to make this point a lot, which is the cost to operate software, given any reasonable length of time, will always exceed uh, the, the cost to develop the software. But most of us spend our time thinking about um, thinking about the development cost, right? What am I paying the devs? How long does that development cost take? But anything that matters in our organizations will always cost us more to operate than it did to develop it. And it will likely live longer. So thinking a lot about optimizing that operational process, the cost of ops, the cost of downtime when ops doesn't go well, uh, I think is, is a much overlooked area. Um, and, and we tend to, most organizations have developed into silos of teams responsible for operations based on the component. So you have experts that know about servers, you have experts that know about storage, you have experts that know about networking, and they operate largely independently of each other. Right? And so when things break, or you have to make substantial changes to the infrastructure, you have a lot of sort of finger pointing between the teams, right? Like, well, this is a networking problem because my server is up and running, or storage is working fine. I don't know why you can't access it. It must be an application code problem. Uh, and so I think the shift in mindset here that you have to appreciate is moving from component-based uh, op component operations to service-based operations. Right? The, the unit of currency here is the application and its availability. Like it, it, uh, and this is why I think you see a lot of teams going to this model of, of DevOps, ultimately, uh, because it forces a breakdown of these silos where you're co-locating people, um, regardless of expertise, into application-centric teams that include developers, include operations staff across the organization. So this is a big cultural shift piece that I think is necessary to really excel in this software-driven world. How are we doing on time? Who has the agenda? Time you should have told me earlier. I was trying to signal you. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Let's see. Well, I'll wrap up. Just give me one more slide here. So who knows Adrian Cocroft? Anybody? OK, Adrian was uh, actually an uh, operating system ninja at Sun back in the day. He wrote a performance tuning guide for Solaris. Uh, he's probably more famous for being um, uh, for being the cloud architect that took Netflix from being in their data centers to in Amazon and built out you know the streaming infrastructure that now drives about seventy percent of the internet traffic at nighttime in the United States. Uh, so a pretty pretty robust application. Um, and so we actually had Adrian come speak at our pivotal conference that we had in Las Vegas at the beginning of August. And at the end of his presentation, he made a point that I think is the, uh, uh, really the pinnacle of how we should think about managing our technology organizations, which is if you, the, the time to code being valuable is actually the most important metric. So if you've written code and it's sitting in a Git repo, not deployed, not being used by customers, how much value have you created? None. Zero. And, and I would argue that you're actually, it's sort of like uh, credit card interest, if it, the longer it sits there before it makes it to prod. 
And so as you think about metrics that are important to, to measure and, and goals that you can set as you go on this transformation journey, I think thinking about this metric of time to value from code complete to production is probably the most important measure you can implement and track across your organizations. And then looking at everything that keeps you from making that window very short and questioning whether you really need it. Or can it be done better or differently in a way that allows you to shrink that time to value? So I'll, I'll conclude there. I'm around all day, so happy to chat more if folks have questions. Thank you very much.